Island of the Blue Dolphins, Chapter 5 That night was the most terrible time in all the memory of Gehalasat. When the fateful day had dawned, the tribe numbered 42 men, counting those who were too old to fight. When night came and the women had carried back to the village those who had died on the beach of Coral Cove, there remained only 15. Of these, seven were old men. There was no woman who had not lost a father or a husband, a brother or a son. The storm lasted two days, and the third day we buried our dead on the south headland. The lutes who had fallen on the beach were burned. For many days after that, the village was quiet. People went out only to gather food and came back to eat in silence. Some wished to leave and go in their canoes to the island called Santa Catalina, which lies far off to the east, but others said that there was little water on the island. In the end, a council was held, and it was decided to stay at Gehalasat. The council also chose a new chief to take my father's place. His name was Kim Kimki. He was very old, but he had been a good man in his youth and a good hunter. The night he was chosen to be chief, he called everyone together, saying, most of those who snared fowl and fit, found fish in the deep water and built canoes are gone. The women, who were never asked to do more than stay at home, cook food, and make clothing, now must take the place of the men and face the dangers which abound beyond the village. There will be gum, grumbling in Gehalasat because of this. There will be shirkers. These will be punished, for without the help of all, all must perish. Kim Ki portioned work for each one in the tribe, giving Ulaip and me the task of gathering abalones. This shellfish grew on the rocks along the shore and was plentiful. We gathered them at low tide in baskets and carried them to the mesa, where we cut the dark red fish from the shell and placed it on flat rocks to dry in the sun. Ramo had the task of keeping the abalone safe from the gulls and especially the wild dogs. Dozens of our animals, which had left the village when their owners had died, joined the wild pack that roamed the island. They soon grew as fierce as the wild ones and only came back to the village to steal food. Each day toward evening, Ulape and I helped Ramo put the abalones in baskets and carry them to the village for safekeeping. During this time, other women were gathering the scarlet apples that grow on the cactus bushes and are called tunas. Fish were caught and many birds were net netted. So hard did the women work that we finally feared better, fared better than before when the hunting was done by the men. Life in the village should have been peaceful, but it was not. The men said that the women had taken the tasks that rightfully were theirs, and now they had become hunters, the men looked down upon them. There was much trouble over this until Kim Ki decreed that the work would again be divided. Henceforth, the men would hunt and the women harvest. Since there was already ample food to last through the winter, it no longer mattered who hunted. But this was not the real reason why autumn and winter were unpeaceful in Gehalasat. Those who had died at Coral Cove were still among us. Everywhere we went on the island or on the sea, whether we were fishing or eating or sitting by the fires at night, they were with us. We all remembered someone, and I remembered my father, so tall and strong and kind. A few years ago, my mother had died, and since then Ulape and I had tried to do the tasks she had done, Ulape even more than I, being older. Now that my father was gone, it was not easy to look after Ramo, who was always into some mischief. It was the same in the other houses at Gehalasat, but more than the burdens which had fallen upon us all, it was the memory of those who had gone that burdened our hearts. After food had been stored in autumn and the baskets were full in every house, there was more time to think about them, so that of so that a sort of sickness came over the village, and people sat and did not speak, nor even laughed. In the spring, Kimki called the tribe together. 
He had been thinking, he said, during the winter, and had decided that he would take a canoe and go to the east to a country which was there and which he had once been to when he was a boy. It lay many days across the sea, but he would go there and make a place for us. He would go alone because he could not spare more of our men for the voyage, and he would return. The day that Kim Ki left was fair. We all went to the cove and watched him launch the big canoe. It held two baskets of water and enough tunas and dried abalone to last many days. We watched while Kim Ki paddled through the narrow opening in the rocks. Slowly he went through the kelp beds and into the sea. There he waved to us and we waved back. The rising sun made a silver trail across the water. Along this trail he disappeared into the east. The rest of the day we talked about the journey. Would Kim Ki ever reach this far country about which nothing was known? Would he come back before the winter was over? Or never? That night we sat around the fire and talked while the wind blew and the waves crashed against the shore.